Hi, I'm Cameron McKenzie. I'm the editor-in-chief over at theserverside.com, and I wanted to help you answer 10 of the most common DevOps interview questions you might encounter. So question number one, name five important DevOps tools. And I would say, if I'm going to answer this question, I'm going to mention the fact that there's probably five different categories of tools, configuration management, source code management, continuous integration, containerization, and collaboration that we probably want to think about when we're thinking about DevOps tools. And there's more categories, I might even talk about monitoring and stuff like that, but I think those are the big ones. And I would say for configuration management, I go with... Chef for Ansible, I'd say with source code management, I'd go with Git. I'm a big Git fan. Continuous integration, I like Jenkins. Containerization, I like Docker. And in terms of collaboration, well, I'm a big fan of using Jira. For question number two, what is continuous integration? I would answer this question by saying, you know, continuous integration is the art of making sure that the code that you check into a shared source code repository compiles. And, of course, continuous integration servers are constantly looking for check-ins. They're looking for commits. And if they find commits, they will try and build the application, make sure that it compiles. And if it doesn't compile, the build fails. And that's typically what we talk about when we talk about continuous integration, making sure that the dev team can t continuously integrate. And of course, if uh, there is a build failure, that means nobody can pull the code, nobody can properly update the code, and development in a distributed manner essentially stops. People can still do isolated development, but distributed development stops, and that's a bad, bad thing. Now, why do we shift left in DevOps? That's something we hear quite often. Shifting left in DevOps simply means taking things that sort of happen on the, the right side of a history graph or a timeline graph of software development and move them to the left, make them happen earlier. And that can often mean things like doing deployments, so get code, uh, get applications in front of your users earlier in the life cycle. That's a pretty big agile tenant, right? Like make get input from your users and let them know if what you're developing is what they want. But even other tasks such as, I don't know, maybe something like performance uh, monitoring and load monitoring, seeing how well your, your application does under load, that's stuff that people tend to do towards the end of the software development life cycle. Shift it left. Do those things earlier. That's part of the idea of doing DevOps. Number four, what does CAMS mean? Uh, typically, the CAMS acronym means Culture, Automation, Measurement, and Sharing, all of which are important in doing DevOps transitions. And I don't know. I think it's a bit bogus. I think those are all important in just doing development, whether you're doing DevOps or not, but it's a, an acronym we often see in the DevOps world. Number five is a bit of opinion piece. Do you think a culture change is a requirement or a result of doing DevOps? The correct answer is that it's a result, um, but there are some people that might argue with me on that point. But a culture is defined by the processes that you use and uh, the practices that you use, the processes you use. Um, and so what happens in DevOps is, is you start introducing new tools, people use them, people use Jenkins, people use distributed development, people use containers. Because they start using those containers, the processes that they go through and the behavior they have, that changes, and then in the end, they, you end up having a culture change. So it ends up being a result. It's not the input. You don't say, oh, we've got to change our culture and then we'll do DevOps, you start doing DevOps, and eventually the culture changes, especially if you're doing DevOps right. Now, name three important DevOps KPIs, key performance indicators. There's a, a number here. I, I find that some of the most important ones are mean time to failure recovery. That is, if something goes wrong, how quickly can your team react? And that involves you know, what we traditionally think of both as developers and operations, because it could be a problem in the code, and it could also be a, a problem with maintaining server and services. That's a big one. Deployment frequency, so how often are we doing deployments? That's a key one as well. It's a key one for Agile as well. And also maybe even taking a look at the percentage of failed deployments. So how often do we deploy and how often do those deployments fail? And we have to, to, to correct something and uh, redo the deployment again. So these are all basic 
KPIs that we can have for doing DevOps. Of course, if you're going to do DevOps, make sure you baseline these first because you need something to compare to so you know if things were good earlier or, or things are getting better or things are getting worse or if you're progressive. Number seven, describe three DevOps anti-patterns. Uh, one anti-pattern, I'd say, is to just replace the development and operations silo with a new DevOps silo. So that's not going to work. Another DevOps anti-pattern is not involving enough stakeholders. So if you just get development, you just get operations, you might be excluding, well, I mean, people from the executive team. You might be excluding people from security. You might be excluding people from the hardware provisioning team. So that's another anti-pattern, not bringing enough people under the tent when you actually go and embark upon Dev DevOps. Another DevOps anti-pattern, this goes on to the KPIs, is not doing a baseline at the beginning to know where you, at, where you are at as you embark upon your transition. And so make sure you do a baseline, make sure you know where you're at, because uh, if you don't know where you're at, uh, you don't know if you're progressing forward or if you're moving backwards. Number eight is a question about what are the benefits to DevOps automation. As far as automation goes, there's a number of benefits. One is it removes the human aspect and it removes the possibility of human error. So if something's automated, you don't have humans there. That also means that when something's automated, that it is repeatable and it's also correctable. So if there's a problem with the automation, you can go in and change the automation. And as you constantly refine your opportunities for automation, your applications get harder, and that is a good thing. It means they're more reliable and they're more robust. I guess uh, another benefit to automating your various processes is that you can remove manual intervention, and that removes bottlenecks from your continuous integration pipeline, and that should hopefully improve the speed of deployments and the number of deployments, all of which are key performance indicators for DevOps. Number nine, name two popular Java development frameworks for creating microservices. I'd quickly answer that question by saying Spring Boot and Eclipse Micro Profile. Those are two of the most popular ones in the Java world. And I'm a Java developer, so I'm always Java-centric. You might want to go and research some .NET frameworks or other languages or frameworks that organizations may be using to develop microservices, especially if you know that the organization that you're working with is a .NET organization or something along those lines. And number 10, what is continuous delivery? Well, continuous delivery, it expands on the idea of continuous integration, but it goes one step forward into the idea that uh, not only is our code compiling and integrating, maybe passing some rudimentary unit tests, but beyond that, we are in a situation where there's a, a main trunk line that developers are regularly integrating into that is always available for delivery, that is always, always ready to be turned into a uh, deployment artifact packaged up as a jar file or packaged up as an executable container and put into deployment. Martin Fowler uh, tends to be a bit of a thought leader. He says you're doing continuous delivery if your software is deployable throughout its life cycle. Your team prioritizes keeping the software deployable over the idea of working on new features that anybody can get fast automated feedback on the production readiness of the system and you can perform push button deployments of any version of the software to any, any environment on demand whenever you want. So anyways, that's uh, 10 of the most commonly asked DevOps interview questions with answers. Hopefully those will help you out. If you're going on a DevOps interview, make sure you can answer those questions. If you disagree with what I've provided as some of the answers, make sure that you can articulate why it is that you disagree. And if you do like my answers, make sure you can put those answers into your own words because you're not going to get anywhere if you just try and memorize or regurgitate some of those answers. Um, so yeah, be able to put those into your own words. And if you can do that, I'm pretty confident you're going to land that DevOps engineering job.